Giuseppe Di Stefano. This evening, Harold Rosenthal presents some impressions of the popular Italian tenor. An Italian tenor singing a Neapolitan song. What visions does that kind of voice conjure up? Warm Mediterranean sunshine, sky blue seas, and all the romance of southern Italy. Perhaps it's no accident that Giuseppe Di Stefano's voice is so suited to this kind of music, for he was born 36 years ago in the town of Catania in the island of Sicily, which is almost as far south as an Italian can get. Unlike many singers, Di Stefano didn't come from a musical family, nor did he have any childhood ambitions to become a singer. His father was a professional soldier, and his mother came from a well-known Sicilian family. The young Giuseppe went to the local Jesuit seminary, where he was considered a brilliant pupil. One of his closest friends at the seminary was a law student, who was also a great opera enthusiast. One day he heard Di Stefano singing a folk song and was so excited by the natural beauty of his voice that he urged him to take up a singing career. Perhaps the song he heard him sing was the popular Abalati. <laughs> Quante femmine chi ci su, cinne quattro scavatati, li facemo qui patati, cinne quattro ammaccatetti, li facemo qui visetti. Shu, 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 quante femmine chi ci su, cinne quattro scavatati, li facemo qui patati, cinne quattro ammaccatetti, li facemo qui visetti. Well, whatever the song was that Di Stefano sang, it took not a little persuasion before either the budding tenor or his family finally decided to take the suggestion seriously. It was wartime, moreover, and money was short, but Giuseppe's parents made a number of sacrifices so that their son could go to Milan to study with the baritone Luigi Montesanto. In 1943, Di Stefano visited Switzerland to sing on the radio and in the hope of joining an opera company. He decided not to return to Italy until the war was over. After a further period of study, he was ready to make his debut in April 1946 at the Teatro Municipale Reggio Emilia in Masne's Manor. His success was phenomenal, and other engagements immediately followed. At this time of his career, his voice was young, his tone was unfailingly beautiful and unusually expressive, and had that rich, velvety sound seldom heard since the days of Gilles and La Rivalpe. 
As an example of his voice at that time, listen to his exquisite performance of Wilhelm Meister's aria from the third act of Ambroise Thomas' opera, Mignon. That is really beautiful Italian singing, and I personally regret that the great shortage of tenors in Italy in recent years has forced Di Stefano more and more, uh, has forced Di Stefano to forsake the lyric repertory more and more in favour of more heroic roles like Canio, Manrico, and even Radamez. By 1948, Di Stefano's success in Europe had procured him an engagement at the Metropolitan Opera in New York, where he made his debut as the Duke in Rigoletto. Descriptions of that event read rather like accounts of what happens when teenagers foregather to listen to their favourite rock and roll exponents. Arias were interrupted in the middle with cries of bravo, and one excited listener was heard to shout, Boy, you're a natural! The critics were kind, and it was noted that the new tenor was free from the many vices of less gifted singers, such as an overuse of portamento, and a love of holding on to top notes in order to elicit applause. He also displayed a fine rhythmic sense. These attributes were brought to the notice of Toscanini, 
who engaged him to sing in a performance of the Verdi Requiem in 1951, a performance that was fortunately recorded. Here is the tenor in the Ingemisco, in which his beautiful singing and covered tone are again reminiscent of the young Gili. Stefano remained in America until the end of the 1952-3 season. He then decided to return to Italy and resume his career in his own country. For since a few odd appearances in the summer of 1950, he felt he'd been too long absent from home. And so in December 1953, he returned to the Scala Milan as Rudolfo in La Boheme. During the same season, he sang in La Gioconda with Maria Callas and began a partnership with the fiery Greek prima donna which despite its ups and downs, including occasions when each has refused to sing with the other, has lasted until the present. This star partnership has not been confined to the opera house, for the two have recorded a number of complete operas together. A very profitable partnership this is too, for artistically both these singers have a fine sense of drama as well as of music. In this next example you'll hear this amply demonstrated. And you will also be able to note how Di Stefano's voice has grown darker and more dramatic than in the earlier records I played. It's part of the great finale to the second act of Donizetti's Lucia di Lamamoir, in which Edgar of Ravenswood, thinking Lucy Ashton has betrayed him, curses her before the assembled guests at her wedding reception. 